Hi hobby friends, let's talk about the Night Lords. It's 10am on Monday, I have the other half of the Horus Heresy box left over from when I painted the Salamanders, and I promised that I'd paint them as the edgiest war criminals this side of the Eye of Terror, the Night Lords. We're going in with a rich purple prime on these guys, using Molotow's Dark Violet as our base. This will give us some really rich shadow tones that should work nicely for that midnight blue these nasty chaps are famous for. Maybe it's because these guys have been sitting on my shelf, built but unpainted for a while, or maybe it's just bad luck, but I got hit with the dreaded non-stick issue most commonly associated with resin minis. The primer pulled up and didn't want to grip at all in certain places. With resin, we all know that you should be washing it with soap and water, but even then you can still miss a spot, so here is my quick tip for dealing with the issue instantly at your desk. The secret is isopropyl alcohol. This is a really useful chemical in the hobby anyway, whether it's for thinning solvent paints, cleaning and stripping models, or fixing basing material rock solid with PVA glue, so I think everyone should have a bottle in their arsenal. But in this case, it's a super quick way to clean off whatever oily residue is keeping your primer from sticking. A lot of the time you can get away with just swishing the mini in a little cup and patting it dry, or spot cleaning with a cotton bud soaked in the IPA. Just bear in mind that it will melt any paint that's already on there, and of course this is a volatile alcohol, so you know, keep the scented candles out of your well ventilated hobby room when you do this. Alright, with the boys cleaned up and the priming finished, I moved on to our first highlight stage, and for this I'm using another Molotow paint, Sahara Beige, which is a sand yellow as you can see. If you've been watching my videos for a while, you know what I'm up to here, and if not, I promise I haven't gone mad or developed a very rare yellow-blue colour blindness. You'll see what's going on in just a second. I'm treating this yellow as the main highlight colour, spraying it on more or less as a zenithal prime, but also trying to shape my volumes a little, as you see here, where I'm doing a pretty classic cylinder highlight on the Dread's body. We've still got space to push that contrast just a little bit more though, so I load up with some thinned Tamiya white and add the last little spot highlight to places like the pauldrons and the faces. This will help really pull focus to where we want it, the head of the minis. On a speedy army painting job like this, it helps to keep things nice and simple. When that's done, it's time to tackle the most iconically Night Lords detail, those lightning bolts. Now, I need to pay some mind to the fact that this is a speed paint job, so I'm limiting the designs to one leg and one shoulder, and for this first pass I'm allowing myself to be really loose. This is part of a plan that you'll see come together over the whole course of this paint job, but let's just say for now that having chunkier lightning at this point is actually a boon. Go fast and go wild, it took me well under a minute per model to get this done. Ok, it's time to get these guys actually blue now. What we've been doing up to now is a chromatic underpaint. Admittedly a pretty tame one compared to some of the other things I've tried on the channel, but still. Over the purple and yellow I'm spraying a thinned, transparent blue, High Lords Blue from Army Painter's Speed Paints range in this case. By using coloured paints for our undertones, rather than a more typical greyscale lighting sketch, we can guarantee super rich tones and interesting hue variation throughout our value gamut on the mini. My association for Night Lords is a sickly sort of desaturated greenish blue in the highlights, and the richest possible deep blue for the dark parts of the mini, and the combo of purple base and sand yellow highlights is giving us exactly that. Time to add the secondary colour of the scheme, that crimson red. To be completely honest, if I were to do this project again, I might leave these pauldrons off and just treat them separately, but since past me didn't really know what he was doing with these models when he built them, present me has to deal with them stuck on. So I'm going in with a high flow, super opaque paint, that is to say Molotow again, and blocking in the red bits. This is their burgundy if you're curious. 
We don't want this pauldron to be flat and unhighlighted though, so back in with Tamiya White to add a spot highlight. I'm going to add a red filter over the top of this, so again, please don't think I'm going crazy spraying white on red here. Normally I choose a warm, high value yellow for my underpainting highlight for red, but sticking with my desire to make these guys a little sickly or drawn looking, I thought it'd be interesting to try straight white, in a sense looking to lose some richness in the hue here. When they were all done, I got some crimson ink and matte varnish on my wet palette and laid down a crimson filter. You could definitely use a contrast paint here, but transparent inks and some kind of heavier bodied medium is a good approximation too. Day two and time to start blocking in the other colors. This is where the grind really starts. I finally picked up some of those much loved scale color metal and alchemy paints and I thought I'd use them for my metally bits this time and yeah, they are very nice metallic paints. Just blocking those in was two hours or so, but the grind was only just beginning. Next, I threw some black on the palette and went after those black bits like the gun, the under armor, and all the bits and bobs the boys like to keep on their belts. Two and a half hours to get through that lot and time to work on the studs now. Now, I'll admit my ignorance here, but there seems to be a not so perfect consensus on whether the Night Lords are trimmed gold or silver. Maybe it's a 30k versus 40k thing, a preference thing, or something else entirely, but I thought I'd hedge my bets by doing the bits on the backpack silver and these studs in gold. In any case, I like the combo, which is all that really matters. 240 studs later, it was time to go for round two on the lightning. This time I'm after a slightly thinner, more controlled look. Because the previous lightning is thicker and partially hidden under that layer of transparent blue, what we're doing here is building up a pretty easy glow effect. And with some brush confidence, you can get through this next layer even faster than the last one, since you aren't really having to think too hard about where your brush is going. This is a good opportunity to mention something about brush control as well. Obviously, just attempting fine work like this more and more is what will really get your brush control game up, but here's something else to consider. Brush control is paint control. What I mean is you can have the steadiest hands, a perfect lighting setup and impeccable 2020 detail vision, but if you're working with paint that is the wrong consistency, you're going to have a bad time. You want the paint running smoothly off the brush, but you don't want flooded bristles. So thin your paints properly, but also tap your brush on a dry bit of paper towel to wick off excess moisture after you've loaded it up. Okay, time to redefine some of those panel lines now. Nothing pushes details on your mini like a little dark outlining. I'm going for an oil wash on these guys, and in true speed painting fashion, I'm looking for a two for one deal with this step. But unfortunately, the army painter paint I used for my blue has the feature of reactivating and rubbing off quite easily. So I'm going to varnish these guys first to make sure everything is locked in place. I'm not using the gloss varnish usually associated with pin lining oil washes though. I'm using a nice matte varnish that will help the wash act not only as a liner, but also as a filter. I'm going to mix up my own really dark blue here using a combo of turquoise, green, and magenta. Now, you could go in with plain old black or a blue you like straight out of a tube, but if you're a bit color mad like me, mixing up your own tone is part of the fun, so why not give it a go? That gets slathered all over these guys, and by the time the last one is done, we can start the cleanup on the first one. Just a nice, easy pass with a makeup sponge, brushing off excess paint on the highest highlights. And if you're a really sharp cookie like me, you can full screen the last episode of that Warhammer Plus show you've been watching while you do it, and not notice that all your cleaning up is happening out of shot. We're up to day three on these guys now, and it's time to start rounding out the details and getting them over the finish line, starting with those eyes. I'm always looking for new options, and on these guys, I tried a slightly modified version of the usual lens and gem technique. 
First, I applied a deep red base coat, then a brighter red along the bottom as you normally would, and then I flooded the lens with a red fluorescent paint, wicking away the excess to leave a little pool at the bottom. When that was dry, I did a similar pass with orange fluorescent paint. That may be four steps, but because none of them requires much control or finesse, the whole process goes quickly and still looks pretty good. The final touch is to add a little specular highlight of white in the upper corners of each lens. Bases now, and the main part was super simple here, a heavy dry brush of dark and then lighter grey. Some very light touches of dry brushed ice yellow here and there gave everything that final pop, but as you might have noticed, there is more than just rubble on these guys. The scenic bits were actually a very kind gift from an Instagram buddy, at Dreadnought Brother Harkus. Massive thanks mate, I hope you like where they ended up. So with some brown on the board, I went to town painting up all the pipes and bits of metal, and then with a stumpy old brush and some bright orange, I stippled on some fresh rust. The final stage for these elements was a quick light dry brush of silver, and while the silver was out, I also gave the guns a quick whip of the dry brush too to pick out the details there. Edge highlighting time now, keeping it super simple with a quick pass of an electric blue. This is really important for definition, so get in the flow and forget about hitting every single edge, and you can get it done pretty quickly. To break up the monotony of that job, I also took the opportunity to do the final pass on my lightning. It may seem crazy going over the same detail three times in a speed paint job, but it's really worth it, I think. And in the grand scheme of things, it's an extra three minutes or so per model, and quite fun when you get the hang of it. It was, however, at this point that I realized I may have missed a trick here. Another option, instead of going for progressively thinner lines to get that glow effect, could be to do totally different lightning patterns at each layer, so you end up with a crazy 3D lightning storm effect. I don't know, but I think it could look pretty cool. Maybe I'll try that on the Praetor if I ever get around to painting him, or maybe even the King of the Goths himself. I grabbed that splodgy brush again to throw some scratchy highlights on the silver metallics and added some creepy, occultish rune free hands to the little shoulder shields of the termies. They also got one last metallic highlight to really sharpen the claws and pop the trim. One pass of 240 studs was not enough for me, so I added some brighter highlights to those, and we were definitely in the bitty detail stage of the game now. I wasn't quite happy with my bases yet though, they needed some more contrast, so I mixed up a quick black oil wash and let that soak into the recesses. And when all of that was dry, I also did one last little pass of light grey dry brushing. The Termi's dangly cloth bits got some dedicated highlights with red, because they were looking a little flat and hey, we're still under an hour per model here, so why not? I also neatened up the edges with some black lining too. Time to smash those last bits now, including the commander guy's bare head, the banner bearer's banner, where I had a little bash at free handing a little stormy sky with an ominous red Roman numeral 12 floating in front of it, and all the various skulls that hang about space marines like undead fanboys. And that was it. But, you know, I did feel a little bit guilty for not kit bashing some flayed corpses onto these guys. So, to give them that real Night Lord's chic look, right at the very end I decided to pull out the Uhu glue and some blood effects paints and mixed them into a gross, chunky, gooey mix of gory ick that when we were kids playing old school FPS games I certainly would have called Gibbs. If you don't know about Uhu glue, it's a great back of the draw hobby supply you can use to add slobber, goo or slime to any project. Definitely worth picking up a tube. Just before we hit the reveals, let me say an enormous thanks to the latest patron to join the OG crew, Ben, aka Ginger Bee. It's the generous support of these fantastic people that feeds my paint addiction and keeps the content flowing. Thank you so much, Ben. If you fancy joining Ben and others in supporting the channel, check the links below where you'll also see there's a link to Discord and my other social media and website stuff. And of course, hitting the like and subscribe buttons is a free way to show your love. 
Go on, give the buttons a tickle. Okay, there you have it. 26 Heresy Era Marines, all done in about 20 and a half hours, or an average of 47 minutes per model. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and I will see you next week.